Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 2, we read just a moment ago, Matthew chapter 2. You know, it's interesting, each of the four Gospels were inspired by God to teach us of the Lord Jesus Christ, but have you ever asked yourself, why are there four Gospels rather than just one all-inclusive Gospel? And why are there different emphases within the Gospel? Each one has its own unique features. Each one has unique accounts of the life of Christ or His teaching. Certainly there are many stories that overlap. They all talk about the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They all detail Him feeding 5,000 and walking on water. But yet at the same time, there are things unique to each one. What's the answer? Why are there different gospel accounts? Well, one of the answers is this. Each gospel was written with a different audience in mind. And so each gospel presents Christ in a different light, addressing the needs of that audience. Now notice the differences, for instance, just in the genealogies of the four gospels. The first one is the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew himself has another name, Levi. And Levi is a very rich Jewish name. And it seems that Matthew was written to the Jewish people. In fact, The theme that you will find throughout the book of Matthew is that Jesus is king of the Jews. In fact, we just read in verse number 2 the account that only Matthew gives of the wise men in verse 2, and they're asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? But the genealogy of Matthew, therefore, goes back through Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, all the way back to David and Abraham, tracing the legal lineage of Jesus Christ, the legal right that he had to the throne of the Jews, because that was the emphasis, Jesus is the king. Then there's the gospel of Mark. Mark appears to target more of a Roman audience and focuses on the actions of Christ, the work. It pictures Jesus Christ as a servant, the servant of the Lord. Jesus says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister or to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, because the emphasis is on Jesus as a servant, there's no genealogy given. It's not important what your bloodlines are if you are a servant, and that's the way Jesus is presented in the Gospel of Mark. Meanwhile, you come to the Gospel of Luke, and Luke was written to a Greek audience, And as he's written to the Greek audience, he has this in mind, that Jesus Christ was the perfect human, that he was the perfect human. And because it focuses on his humanity, when you look at its genealogy, it traces his genealogy through Mary and goes all the way back to Adam in in Luke's genealogy because it's focusing on his humanity. Meanwhile, in the Gospel of John, you have the emphasis on Jesus Christ's divinity, that he was God in the flesh. So guess what his genealogy is in John? You hear it, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says Jesus, as God in the flesh, has always been God. And that's the genealogy. So you can find the different emphasis in each one of the Gospels. It's my desire over the next few services to preach on Christmas through the different lenses of these Gospels, emphasizing what each Gospel emphasizes about the Lord. And so this morning, we start with the Gospel of Matthew, and we look at Jesus Christ, the newborn King. Let's begin with a word of prayer as we enter into His Word this morning. Father, I thank You today for the privilege of being in Your house. And Lord, I pray that we would all, from our heart and within, bow in Your presence. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, worthy of our reverence, of all of our thoughts, of our greatest gifts, of all that we are. Lord, in these moments, we pray that you would help us to give these fully over to you, to consider the truth that is before us, and Lord, to realize that we all have a response that is necessary before the King. Lord, may we all bow before you, not just today, but every day. May we serve you as king of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look here in Matthew today, the first thing I'd have us to note as Jesus is the king is the revelation, the revelation of the word of God. It's foretold in prophecy that when the Messiah would come, that he would be a king. 
In fact, in Matthew chapter number 1, look there if you would, it talks about Jesus Christ, and it, it is the prophecy that was given to Mary by the angel. And we're told in verse number 20, while he thought, I'm sorry, to Joseph, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. You notice here he's going to quote from the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This is a prophecy of Isaiah 7 and verse number 14. And in that passage, when you read it, we know the words, Behold, I show you a sign. But it's interesting, in that passage, who is being shown the sign? Isaiah talks directly to the house of David. David's house, the kingly house, the, the house of the king was the one to whom this prophecy was given that Emmanuel, God with us, would be born of a virgin and would come to earth. We could go to places like Isaiah chapter 9 in verses 6 and 7 where it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the prince, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Listen, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. We also see in Micah chapter five and verse number two, it was the prophecy of the birthplace of Jesus Christ, where there we're told, but thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. The ruler whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. We read in Zechariah chapter 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. So what we find throughout the Old Testament is in the prophecies regarding the coming Messiah, that this Messiah would be the king. And so Matthew is telling us that Jesus Christ is not just a king, but he's that king, the king that was prophesied long before. Look at the very first verse of Matthew chapter 1 and notice how he begins his gospel. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, notice, the son of David. He's declaring that Jesus Christ is the answer to the promise, the fulfillment to the promise given to David. David was told in 2 Samuel chapter number 7, Thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. It is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that is what Matthew is going to emphasize. As he goes down through the genealogy, you'll notice in verse number 6, as he's talking of all these individuals and who these ones gave birth to, starting at Abraham, he says, Jesse begat David who? David the king. He's laying out the framework of Jesus as king. As you were to go on through the Gospel of Matthew, we've already read chapter 2, where there Matthew traces those that would welcome Jesus after his birth, the wise men, as they came looking for him that was born king of the Jews. In Matthew chapter number 3, we have the ministry of John the Baptist, and we notice what his ministry was in verse number 2. Repent ye, he preached, for the what? The kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're told in verse number 3 that he was the one who went before Jesus Christ, preparing the way of the Lord. He was the forerunner. In those days before a king would come into a community, before a king would enter into the city gates, there would be a forerunner to go ahead of him and herald the news. The king is coming. The king is coming. Get ready. The king is coming. And Matthew's telling us that was the work of John the Baptist. He came into Israel and he proclaimed, the king is coming. And so we get into chapter number four of Matthew and you find this theme continued that Jesus Christ was the king. He himself, as he began to preach at the end of the chapter in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, notice what he preached. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm offering to you 
acceptance and reception into the kingdom of heaven because Jesus himself was the king. It's in the Gospel of Matthew where you find more mention of the kingdom of heaven and of the kingdom of God than any of the other Gospels. Jesus repeatedly proclaims the kingdom of heaven is at hand and many parables that Jesus taught dealt with that kingdom all through Matthew chapter 13. Seven different parables that Jesus teaches and he tells us the kingdom of heaven is like unto and gives what it's like unto. Seven times, over and over through the gospel, Jesus is the king. In chapters 5 through 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount where he describes his kingdom. He describes its laws. He describes its citizens. He describes its nature. Notice in the very first part, In verse number three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. It concludes in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter number seven, where the people were astonished. It says astonished at his doctrine in verse number 28. Why? Because he taught them as one having authority. Of course he taught as one having authority because he's the king. And that's what a king does. He speaks with authority. As you go to the remainder of the book in Matthew chapter 21, there as Jesus comes, he again quotes from Zechariah 9, Behold, thy king cometh to thee. He records the words of Jesus in Matthew 25 about when Jesus comes back to earth in his second coming. And there Jesus speaking, he says, The Son of Man shall come in his glory, and they shall, and, and then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And he speaks of himself in these words, Then shall the king say unto them, Jesus is the king. Even in his death, Matthew records for us the words that Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest. Again, in the inscription written above him as he's on the cross, Pilate wrote the words, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. What a way for a king to die. Finally, the book of Matthew records these words of Jesus Christ. In his final declaration, we read in Matthew chapter 28, All authority is given unto me, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Not just king of earth, not just king of the Jews, but king of all, Jesus Christ, king of kings. So this is the theme. This is the revelation of who this one that was born was born to be, that he was the newborn king. But as we think of the revelation, maybe we should ask ourselves, well, what is his right to be king? Does Jesus have the right to be king, to be declared king, to rule as king? Does Jesus have that right? Well, obviously, we've already looked at the genealogy in Matthew chapter number one. But again, the focus of that genealogy is to declare his human right to the throne. Jesus' stepfather, Joseph, had a direct line, direct descendant from David. And because he was a stepfather, Jesus Christ then had the legal right to the throne. By the way, it was through Mary, his, his biological mother, as a, as a man, that he received the throne by birth. Because he's a direct descendant of David through Mary. He has the legal right through Joseph. He has the blood right through Mary. Furthermore, we find in Matthew chapter 1 that he was virgin born. And because he was virgin born and he was not born to Joseph, that he escaped the curse that was on Jeconiah. One of the kings that descended from David had a curse upon him that those who came after him would never be blessed in their reign. And Jeconiah was one of the predecessors of Joseph. But because Jesus was not born of Joseph and Mary, but just of Mary, he escapes that curse, and he is blessed in his reign. The right of Jesus Christ by virtue of his genealogy, but not only that, by virtue of who he is. Jesus Christ has the right to the throne by virtue of who he is. Again, we look in Matthew chapter 1, and we find his name in verse 23. In the prophecy, his name, and, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel, God with us. By virtue of who he is, he has right to reign. Jesus was God in the flesh. As it declares in John 1.14, this word who was with God in the beginning and was God from the beginning, we read in verse 14, the word became flesh. So we see in verse 23, God with us. Again, we notice in verse number two, as the wise men come from the east, It says, we have seen his star. (laughs) 
Now, I know that kings have a lot of glory, and I know there's a lot they can lay claim to, but I can't think of any other king that had a star that heralded his birth. There was a star of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. It's interesting as you study history that kings of the past, particularly in Europe, claimed a divine right to kingship. They claimed that God gave them the right to be king. They were absolute monarchs. They wielded unchecked power and authority, claiming this right was uh, was bestowed on them by God. And in possessing this divine right, they were not subject to any human or human government or any human law. That was their claim. Ones like Louis XIV and King Henry in, in England, who just did as they pleased. But all men who've laid such claim to that right are usurpers. There's only one who has the divine right of a king, and that's Jesus Christ. By virtue of who he is as God in the flesh, he's not subject to any man or any human government or any human law. He is the king, and it is his right to claim such authority. He has a divine right to be king. Furthermore, we can learn that Jesus Christ has the right to be king, not just by his genealogy and bloodlines, not just by who he is, but also by virtue of his character. Jesus Christ is unlike any other. Jesus Christ is perfect in holiness, perfect in love, in justice, in mercy. Psalm 24 tells us of the coronation of the king of glory. It asks the question, who shall ascend into the, into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? Who has the right to take the throne? Who has? Who has the character that is needed? And the answer comes, he that hath clean hands, he that hath a pure heart, he who has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he who is true, who, he who is faithful, he who is righteous can take the throne. There's only one who can lay claim to such character, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the king. His purity, his perfection declare that he is the only rightful king. So here in the Gospel of Matthew, we have it revealed that Jesus Christ is the newborn king. And we discover the right that he had to be king. But we also discover the rejection of Jesus Christ as king. Notice, if you would, in Matthew chapter number 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, There came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, those outside of Israel come, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And we read these words. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. The news of the king's birth reaches Jerusalem by means of the wise men. In chapter 2, a king is born. The king that was prophesied has come. He's here. What would be the expected reaction to that? Saying about a little bit ago, if I looked up recently, what, what was Prince George received at? Prince George is the one that was born to William and Kate back in 2013. What did Prince George, what does he receive here as the, as the coming king of England? Well, he's been welcomed by dignitaries and world leaders from across the globe. He has been gifted custom-made skateboards from Australia. He was given a pet crocodile, his own herd of cattle in Africa, his very own meerkats. He has a bike bike with a plaque inscribed with a crown and the initial G. He has a miniature sea legs amphibious boat that drives on land and rides on water. He has a customized surfboard emblazoned with his name. The Pope gave him an ornamental orb uh, orb made of semi-precious stones accompanied by a manuscript from the 17th century. One of the friends of the prince, who was a a noble there in England, said, I want to bring flowers to the the new prince, but the flowers will wilt and fade and die, so I'm not going to give him flowers. Instead, I'm going to give him a whole field of flowers that will just continue living. That's what he received. Prince George has been estimated today to be worth... $3.6 $3.6 billion. Not bad for a six-year-old. $3.6 billion. But you know, none of this is really surprising, is it? I don't think any of this shocks us. Why? Well, he's a king, right? He's the prince. That's what a king receives. 
And yet we look at the reaction of Jesus Christ, and it's something entirely different, isn't it? We find instead of being received, we find him rejected. Again, the words of verse number 3, the news of his birth troubled Herod, and it troubled all of Jerusalem. Think about that. The rejection by Herod. Herod was a wicked man. We know from history that he lived full of suspicion, was always paranoid that those around him would try to take the throne from him. By this point in his life, he's not going to live much longer. And at this point in his life, he had already executed three of his own sons, one of his wives, his brother-in-law, his mother-in-law, and his wife's grandfather. He hated people. He didn't want anyone to take his throne. In verse 16, we find here King Herod and how he ultimately responds when the wise men don't return to him. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding raw, full of rage. And he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. The slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem and around. Two years old and under. What a wicked man. What was the motivation? To be rid of Jesus. To be rid of the king. Why? Why would he want to kill the newborn king? It's simple, isn't it? We understand. Because Jesus was a threat. Jesus was a threat. Herod recognized that men and women can only have one king. We can only serve one master. There can only be one ultimate authority. And Herod wanted that position for himself. He wanted to be king. And he couldn't stand the thought of anyone else. You know, the postmodern society in which we live is much the same. There's no problem with, with society accepting Jesus as a good teacher to learn from. People don't have an issue with with looking at Jesus as one of several voices to guide us. But King of kings and Lord of lords, society isn't having it. Because if Jesus is king, then I'm not. If Jesus is king, then no one alive on this planet today is king. If Jesus is king, we answer to him. He makes the rules, and society doesn't like those rules. We just witnessed this this past week in the news. A school in London changed the lyrics to Away in a Manger. The kids would sing it Away in a Manger, Away in a Manger, it said. And, and instead of saying the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head, it said the little baby Jesus laid down his sweet head. Don't call him Lord. Don't call him King. Well, they said that's offensive. And you see, it does offend the human heart. Because from the beginning of time and Satan's fall, the heart has always been, I want the place of supremacy. I want to be king. And that was the drive and motivation of Satan. And that's the drive and, and what he even tempted Adam and Eve with in the garden. He said, you will be as gods if you eat of this fruit. And so many today still fall prey to that temptation. That's the whole purpose of the theory of evolution is to remove God and make man the king. But you know what actually happens is when you remove God, you make man an animal. And he's no better in value than a rock that you could find in the street. Jesus Christ is the king. Many individuals today are in the same place. They want a Jesus who will yield to their demands. A Jesus who will not judge them. But understand, he's the king. He's the righteous judge. He doesn't bow to us. We must bow to him. He's the king. We find Herod rejected him because Jesus was the king. We find also in these verses, not only that Herod rejected him, but also, and, and this one perhaps baffles us even more, it says the whole city of Jerusalem was also troubled. The whole city was troubled. Why was Jerusalem troubled at the thought of a newborn king? What, was it that they feared the wrath of Herod themselves? Knowing who he was, knowing his character, did they think, well, what's he going to do because of this? Maybe they feared rather than Herod. Perhaps it was fear of Rome. They were under Roman rule at that point in time. And you know what? In Jerusalem, there were some that were getting along pretty good. 
They were doing all right. Word of a king, well, the Romans might come through and, and everything would be ruined. We introduce Jesus into this equation where everything's going so well. Well, well, it's just going to make waves. <laughs> I hope this king just leaves us alone and will just let us be. Jesus coming, by the way, did more than just make waves. It shook the world. He doesn't want anyone to remain in the ship, that ship of, that is sinking in sin and unbelief. And he urges whosoever will to abandon ship and find safety in him. These Jews were content on that sinking ship, that ship of unbelief. But Jesus came to rescue. They were enjoying the ride. <laughs> Just keep silent with those words that would demand change. Don't inconvenience us with the truth. That's the way people are today. You try to present truth. I'm doing okay. And you introduce Jesus into the equation and you bring out Jesus' demands as king. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or as Jesus preached in Mark chapter 1, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Hey, I'm doing okay. I don't want that right now. <laughs> Things are going well in my life. Things are going splendidly. When I get needy, when things fall apart, well, then I'll turn to Jesus. Just like in Jerusalem. They just want to sleep on. That night, that day, the wise men came into Jerusalem and started speaking of the king. Those that had been lulled to sleep by Satan's devices, those who weren't looking for the king, those who themselves had not studied the proclamations and prophecies to know that the king had come, they were sleeping. The wise men came, and as they spoke of a king that is born to the Jews, they were like declaring, wake up, <laughs> arise. The king has come. They were just trying to put it off. They wanted to sleep through because things were going just fine. The alarming reality in all this passage to me, if you read in Matthew chapter 2, is in verse number 4, Herod gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together and he demanded of them where Christ, the Messiah, should be born. You see, Herod knew it was the Messiah who would be king. Where would this Messiah come? And the scribes said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And they quote from Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. The scribes had the truth. They had the word of God right in front of them. I believe these wise men who came from the east were influenced from men like Daniel of the past. And Daniel actually wrote when the Messiah would come in Daniel chapter number 9. He talks about in 70 weeks and in the number of years, and I believe that the wise men are able to put these things together and say the king has come, especially as the star appeared. But why are those who had the truth right there in front of them? Why didn't they know? And why didn't they go when the wise men departed? And I find today there's many people who have the truth all around them. The Messiah, the king, has come. And yet they don't go to the king. They don't go to the Messiah. They don't come to him and find in him salvation and new life and grace. For that's what saves. We notice in this passage the rejection of the king. But you know there's something else that we rejoice in in this passage. And that is the rejoicing before the king. As we continue in Matthew chapter number 2. We find the wise men. And no doubt, as they saw the star in the east, as they journeyed to them in their minds, where would the king be born? Where would the king be? It just makes sense, right? He'd be in the capital. He'd be in the palace. He'd be in Jerusalem. So the wise men enter into Jerusalem, and I'm sure they're full of expectation. Where is he that's born king of the Jews? And nobody knows anything about it. The wise men, what do you suppose that would do in their hearts and minds? <laughs> Start to get a little bit worried, maybe? Did we misread the star? How is it we've come and the one who's born king of the Jews, the Jews don't even know about it? What's going on? They ask the king. They ask the scribes. They get their answers. And so they start heading out towards Bethlehem. And we notice the words in verse number 9. When they'd heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great 
joy. Their whole journey, how many months had they been planning this? How long had they been en route? It wasn't like today. They didn't hop in their car and drive across the desert. They had to journey in their caravan. And, and after all these weeks and months had passed, they finally have arrived. And they get to Jerusalem and they can't find the king. And their whole journey and their whole search is perhaps going to come up empty. They say, well, let's just follow the word of God, which said Bethlehem. And by the way, always follow the word of God. And when they acted on what the word of God had said, the star reappears. And it says they were full of exceeding great joy. Oh, I'm sure they were troubled. I'm sure some doubts had entered their mind. But the star reappears and there's rejoicing. And that star came and led them right to the king. You know what? There are people today who have seen light from God. And they've been led to a place where maybe they thought that they would find salvation. And they get into a spot where they think it is, and they think, oh, it's, it's in religion, or, or it's in getting baptized, or, or it's in doing good things. And, and that's where they think that they'll find a relationship with God. But they get there and they see, He's not here! And they're looking for an answer. The Word of God points them to where Jesus Christ is. And they find Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus Christ that they find life. By faith in Jesus Christ. Whosoever, the Bible says, believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's in Jesus as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And in coming and finding Jesus as they act on the promise of the word of God, there's rejoicing. Do you remember the day that you found Jesus Christ like these wise men? Do you remember the peace that swept your heart? The thrill, the promise of God is mine. I'm saved and I have everlasting life. Not because I have a feeling, not because of something a church told me, but by the very promise of God himself. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Praise God, we can be saved. Praise God, in Jesus Christ we have salvation. When we've been saved, we know what these wise men experienced, that exceeding great joy. You know, for us at Christmas, that time of rejoicing should continually come, should it not? And every day, because we've been saved. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose iniquity is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute, sin, uh, will not impute that sin. Praise God for that. Instead, we have imputed righteousness. He's made me it's his own child. That's what the Word of God says. Praise God for that. There's rejoicing in that. You know, it's interesting as we sing and we think of the Christmas songs, how many of them echo the sentiment of the newborn king. We sang, Hark the Herald. Hark the Herald angels sing, what? Glory to the newborn king. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. O holy night. As it concludes, I believe it's the second stanza, the words, Behold your king the first noel born is the king of israel what child is this which laid to rest on mary's lap is sleeping and what is the answer in the chorus this this is christ the king we can praise god today that jesus is king that ought to rejoice our heart we look at the problems in the world when we look at the suffering that's here you know, we can be like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. We heard the story last Sunday night about how he looked in with despair on the world. He was living in the time of the Civil War. His wife had died. His own son he was separated from. Things were falling apart in his life. But then he was reminded as he heard the bells of Christmas, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The right, the wrong shall fail. The right will prevail, right? Because Jesus is king. and He's coming back as king as well. So we can sing those songs and rejoice. And shouldn't we sing those songs with rejoicing? If we found the king, shouldn't we sing with rejoicing? Of course we should. There's one final thought in this passage. We see in the wise men, they're rejoicing over the king, but also we see their reverence of the king. And for those of us that have found the Lord Jesus Christ, those of us who've been saved by his grace, now this is ultimately the great application. If Jesus is king, then what does that mean for me? 
That means, number one, I'm not. I shouldn't bow to my wishes or wants. We all have probably heard the statement before. I, I heard it through several pastors older than me. My dad used to say, disappointed in, in people's decisions, and he would say, people are going to do what people want to do. You know what? If you're a child of God, it ought not be that way. It should never be, I'm going to do what I want to do. Never. My heart ought to always be, I'm going to do what the king wants me to do. He's the king, not me. He's the one who makes the laws. He's the one who sets the, 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 the pattern. He's the one who calls me and I must go. We've seen it in the Gospel of John as his I am statements. He said, my sheep hear my voice, right? And I know them and they do what? They follow. Why? Because he's the king. He's the king. In this passage, we notice in verse number 11, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. You know what we're going to do when we see Jesus? I believe we're going to fall down right on our face. Even John himself, the one that we refer to as the beloved disciple, when he saw Jesus in his glorified state in Revelation chapter 1, do you know what the Bible tells us about John, that one who was so close to the Lord while he was on earth? John tells us this, I fell at his feet as dead. I dropped like a bag of bricks. I just fell on my face. Why? Because he's the king of glory. He's the king of all. We bow before him. We fall at his feet and we worship him. And obviously that's why we're here today. We're here to bow before him, to express his worth. When we speak of worship, it comes from the old English worthship. How much worth do we ascribe to the king? What is he worthy of from me? He's the king. We bow before Him in admiration. We bow before Him in, in submission. He's the one that we must bow to and none other. And let none other take His place. You notice in the passage in verse number 11, as they bow to Him, it says, They fell down and worshipped Him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto Him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Did you ever ask why those three were chosen? I think that gold is obvious, right? If I was going to go before a king, I would think that gold would be one of the first things that would come to my mind. Something precious, something valuable, something that is the best. We find also in frankincense. What was the purpose in that? Frankincense was a pleasing aroma. It's a fine fragrance would surround the king and, and be pleasing to his senses. And then we find them presenting myrrh. Why myrrh? Myrrh is present not only at the birth of Christ, but it was the one of the three gifts that was also present at his death. Because we read that myrrh was brought by Nicodemus to the tomb where Jesus lay. Why did they bring myrrh? I believe they followed the Holy Spirit's leading and they brought something that foreshadowed the very purpose of the king in his first coming, to give his life a ransom for our sins. This was a gift divinely motivated by the Spirit of God for telling the greatest work of this king. When you think of those three things that the wise men brought, I think we can take application. What am I going to offer to the king? What are the gifts that I present to him? What can I bring in my reverence for him? Well, just as they brought gold, you and I ought to bring our very best. There's an old song we used to sing while I was growing up. Give of your best to the master. Your very best. You know, we, we sometimes give to God the leftovers. <laughs> That's not the way it ought to be. He deserves us all. In fact, when we're born again, when we're saved, the Bible says that I belong to him. We're bought with a price. And so it tells us again and again, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with your might. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, that we give him of our best, for he deserves the best. That's what our king deserves, the very best. But not just in the sense of the gold. What about the frankincense? What's the aroma that is pleasing and sweet to the Lord? The book of Philippians, it speaks of our offerings, those offerings given out of love as a odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. When we give out of love for Him, when we give out of love for others, then that is something that is pleasing to the Lord. 
Likewise, in the book of Revelation, we find that there are golden vials in the throne room of God full of fragrances, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints are an aroma. And we pour out our heart before God and we adore Him in our prayer life. That is something that is sweet to our King. Furthermore, with myrrh. We bring ourselves like the wise men to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and to die to self and live unto God. These are the things that we bring. Ultimately, the root of giving unto the king, it's all about the heart. What does God need from me? What does he need? What can I give him that he doesn't already have? Do you realize if God was lacking anything, he wouldn't be God? He's got everything. So what does he need from me? The answer is nothing. What could I give that could add anything to him? Nothing. What he desires is us to come to him with a heart that longs to please him. When I was a boy, I remember in our grade school class, my, my teacher had a time getting us to behave, uh, kind of rambunctious. But she had a system in place. And when we did well, and we did well in our homework, she filled up a bag. She taped the bag to the front of our desk, and she'd fill it up with marbles. And at the end of the week, we'd count up how many marbles were there, and, and she would keep a tally in a notebook of how many marbles we had received. And we could lose marbles if we didn't do right, if we didn't get our homework done, if, if we kept messing around in class. We'd lose our marbles. I think she lost hers dealing with us. But at the end of a month, she would tally up all the marbles we'd have, and she would open up a store. And all the stuff that she had in the store, I don't know if she'd picked it up at garage sales or Goodwill. It was all secondhand stuff. And some of it, you know, was toys because we were kids. But there were things there, too, that, that weren't toys. I'm not sure why she got them there or why she had them for kids. But I remember Christmas was coming up, and this was the last store before Christmas. And I looked at some of the stuff that she had on the table, and I thought, I need to get something for my mom. And so I remember going over the table, and I, I, don't, I know I got three things for my mom off the table. I don't remember what the third one is. I don't know what happened to it, all right? But two of those things she kept, and she may still have today. One was this little dog statue. I've seen it in, in my later years here, and it's ugly. But you know what? I got that for my mom. I thought it was the greatest thing. I wrapped it all up. A second thing that I got for her was this mirror. And a mirror, and it had this kind of weird design, all flowery all over the outside. Again, hideous. And uh, that's why it was in this store, right? But I looked at that, and I said, oh, my mom would love that, you know? I got to get something for my mom. And I can remember just wrapping it all up. And, and that day, Christmas, I was excited. Mom's got presents for me. Did she need that dog statue? <laughs> no. No, not for a minute. Did she need that mirror? No. She had mirrors everywhere. But you know what? When she opened them up, thank you. And she kept them. Why? Because it was from my heart. Right? It wasn't something that she needed, but because her little boy just wanted to please mom. You know, in the same way, we can look at it and say, what can I give to God? He has everything. And it all starts right there. Just a heart. I just want to please him. I'll give him my best. I know he doesn't need me. I know that it's going to be the ugly dog on the shelf for years to come, but I'm going to give him the best that I've got. I just want to please my Lord. You know what? That's what God desires from you. Where's your heart with God today? You know, from time to time, I see these, I see new Christians. And they, they don't know all the word of God yet. And, and they're still growing. And maybe they don't know the right words to say when they pray and these sorts of things. But, but yet they've got something that oftentimes we miss that have known the Lord for many years they still got that heart that's just excited. Just, just want to give something to God. Just, I just want to please Him. The one who saved me. 
the one who's my king, and I'll reign with forever. I just want to please the king. You know what? I hope that's your desire today. You've been saved. You come to this Christmas season. You know, we get so busy. It's a busy time. We've got a lot of gifts to get for our family. We've got to make sure that we have that protected within us. But the main thought, now and all through the year, I just want to please the King. I just want to please this one who's loved me and saved me, pours out upon me again grace after grace. As it says in His Word, He gives grace in place of grace. He never stops giving. His mercies are new every morning. And every good gift has come from Him. He's been so good to me. I just want to please the King. I hope that's your heart today. Maybe you're here today and thoughts of Jesus, like Herod in Jerusalem, trouble you. The thoughts of His claims, that He's King, that He's Lord. I'd point you to His character. You'll never find a greater King to serve. One who gave his life for you to take away your sins and rose again. He is holy. He is pure. He is merciful. And I just appeal to you based on his character today. Trust him to save your soul. Jesus made the statement, all who come to me I'll in no wise cast out. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Have you trusted Him to save you and make you a part of His kingdom? Or have you been trusting religion? Have you been trusting your own good things? Have you been just so busy that you don't think about Jesus? Well, today, don't miss it. Because He's the King. You need to have and know and be a part of the King's kingdom. Maybe you're here today, so I know I've been saved. Have you been living as though he's the king? Or have you been living as though you're the king? Whose will do you serve? Who is it you're seeking to please? Please the king. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today and I thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. Lord, we bow before you. You are king of kings. Lord, it's a a privilege to serve in your courts. And Lord, what grace that we'd not just be servants, but that you have made us sons. That you have made us your own, your children. That you've lifted us up and even called us your friends. Oh, how wonderful it is to serve the King of Kings. And Father, we just thank you today. We bow. We long to adore you. Father, we want to have a heart such as these wise men to come and to offer you our gifts What is best? That which brings pleasing aroma to your nostrils, Lord. That which thrills your heart. Lord, may we die to self and live unto Christ. Oh, Lord, today I pray that you would just take your word. Help us evaluate in our lives who is king. Who is king of us. Lord, if there's one in our presence today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, has not received Jesus Christ, his gift of eternal life, Lord, maybe they're troubled by some of these thoughts today. I pray they'd find peace through Christ. Lord, I pray that they would be able to rejoice that they've been saved. May you help them today to understand it's not in religion, it's not in our doing, but it's in what Christ has done. They can trust Him and He will save them and change them. Oh, Lord, today I just pray the day that you would do that work that only you can do. Lord, may we be more like Christ that know you and honor you this Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.